Hello and welcome to my guest, my wonderful guest today, the amazing Patrick McEwen, who I am a massive fan of. Uh, and I came across your work, Patrick, um, in December 2020, when I saw uh, a podcast that you did uh, with James Nestor on Breathe. And it was just one of those, you know, I have a light behind me because I call them, well, I actually call them my what the fuck moments, but they were light bulb moments where you hear information that's given to you and you're just like, why has nobody ever told me this? Uh, and, the, and then I delved into your work. And, um, you know, the first thing I came across of yours was your work with asthma, um, and um, but first of all, I'm going to say that you're the creator and you're the CEO and director of education for Oxygen Advantage. Uh, but you also are, are one of the very few people credited by the late Professor Bukito. Have I pronounced that correctly? Buteco, nearly. Buteco, Buteco. Yeah. I wasn't sure. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, so I thought I'd check with you. Uh, so you're one of the very few people and he did amazing work with asthmatic children. Uh, so um, I'd like to start with the day that you were at secondary school and you went for your careers meeting and they said, Patrick, what would you like to be in life? And you didn't go, well, actually, I'm going to be a, a, a renowned international breathwork coach. <laughs> What did, what did you say? What was going to be your career? Um, initially, I left school at 14 years of age, and this was back in the 80s. And it, it was fairly common for people to do, especially if they felt they weren't academic. I didn't feel I was academic at all. I struggled in school. I was fine in primary school. I was pretty much up there, top of the class. In secondary school, I went from the top of the class down to the bottom of the class. Wow. I had issues with breathing, I had issues with sleep, I had issues with focus and concentration. So I didn't want to be in school and I felt that I was getting nothing out of it. Can I just ask you, did anybody at that point ask you why no. you had problems focusing or why? No, 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 never, no. never. Um, now, I wasn't going to leave school to be a waster either. My, my career path, I wanted to own a shop. So I, I was working in retail since the age of 11. And I hoped to have my own shop for, it was a local Londis shop. So I was working there and I became a trainee shop manager. So that's why I left school. The shop was sold and I was too young to be taken on because I wasn't quite the legal age to be working full time. So I had to go back to school. And then when I went back to school, I went into a different environment and um, in terms of different peer group and also uh, it kind of set different sites, different aspirations, and I worked quite hard. So I got into university then, got into a university in Dublin, Trinity College. I did my degree there, but it could have been a lot easier, you know, and that's why, like, it's now many years. That was, I graduated in 1997, and I, got, I worked for the corporate world then, and I didn't like it at all because, again, I wasn't trained how to deal with stress. I wasn't trained how to concentrate. I didn't know how to concentrate. And of course, I'm not alone and I'm not alone with any of my experiences. You know, no. there's many young kids, highly intelligent, but with poor sleep and with dysfunctional breathing patterns, it's really holding them back. But Philly, this is the thing. This is not new information. Like it has been transformative using these skills. I've used them now for myself, even if I was to never teach them to anyone else for 25 years, they really, really help. It's great to have an understanding of how how your physiology influences your state of mind. And people go into, you know, poor breathing patterns. They're not aware of it. And they don't realize just how much you can influence your state of mind. And you can. I, I think it's really important to bring up there that most people don't even think about their breathing patterns. It, we're not taught at school. We're not. Uh, I never, ever had the conversation with my parents about, you know, they say, sit up with your back straight to eat dinner, um, you know, don't slouch your shoulders, don't do this. Um, and they talk about health, uh, don't eat that crap, but they never once said to me, oh, you're breathing through your mouth. Um, it's it's just not discussed about sleeping uh, yes. with your mouth open because this is something I learned from you and one of your podcasts um, is mouth taping. Mm. And when you think about it, we spend a third of our life asleep. And 
we're wasting that time if we're breathing through our mouth. So can you just talk us through mouth taping, which has been a godsend for me because I did used to sleep with my mouth open and snore. Um, and then I learned from you mouth taping. So run, run us through it. <laughs> yeah, mouth taping, it doesn't have to be so barbaric as it seems, you know. Um, it was something that I started doing back in 1998 for myself. It was amazing. It took me a day or two to get used to it. It was the second day when I really remember waking up feeling refreshed. I used to never wake up feeling refreshed, you know, always waking up with a dry mouth. And a dry mouth is, is trauma to the upper airways, you know, and it's going to contribute to issues with your lungs, issues with your throat, um, issues with your mouth, dental health and everything else. But um, we use a tape called Myo Tape, and I don't want to make a blatant plug, but it was a tape no, that feel we, free. we brought out for kids and teenagers because... We couldn't have children like I'm working with children since 2002 full time with children and adults and with children from four years of age onwards. And I wrote books back in 2003, ABC, Always Breathe Correctly, to get this information to the young kids. I wrote a book with Professor John Mew, very interesting character from um, London in 2010 about his work, Buteco Meets Dr. Mew. So that's for teenagers and parents. And the taping of the mouth is, is really important. Um, so this here is the myotape. And okay. Now, this is the adults one. This is the, the tan color. There's also a blue one as well. So you, you get it and you stretch it about 30 to 40 percent. And then you just gently press it to your face. Now, what it's doing is it's stimulating a muscle here, the orbicularis oris muscle, to help bring the lips together. But it's also pulling your lips together. You can see the pouting there. Yeah. And it's pulling the lips together, but there's no risk. So if a child was to get freaks, if they were to get sick or something, there's not a risk there because the child Brilliant. or if a ch child was having an epileptic seizure, or if there's anything going on. So it's bringing the lips together, but it doesn't have the risk of actually covering the lips. I've got to get that. I've got to get that. I'll, so, we'll put it in the show links, but great. um, uh you can buy this online yeah it's cheap like you? it's it's 25 dollars for that's including the shipping worldwide and that's for three months supply well it's for 90 strips so it's almost three months supply fantastic just i i hate waste it's one of my big things sure <laughs> i i believe that everything is connected in the planet our health is connected to the the planet the soil um and that we abuse it a little bit so could you reuse one of those you more than can once? now what would you could do is when you take them off in the morning now sometimes though because of the elasticity it rolls up into a ball you'd have to put it back on the paper that you've okay. taken it off so, you know, you can you can do it that way. I think sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't because if it just goes in because yeah. of the tension, yeah. it just goes back. I, in I have to yeah. ask because it's one of my things. Yeah, no, of course. Absolutely. And if people can <laughs> reuse them like it's we're happy out. It's all good. Yeah, no. Um, I, and whatever you do, don't, don't go and put a load of duct tape over your kid's mouth. <laughs> you can dramatically help somebody with asthma. And I'm not just saying it because of like, no, the, the exercise for kids are free. We put these exercises out there. If somebody goes to our, our website or if they download the Buteco Clinic app, they have all of the exercises for children for asthma completely for free. That's brilliant. And there's Absolutely nine exercises brilliant. there. The dolphin exercise is brilliant. Getting the mouth closed is very important. And th the thing is like kids and adults with asthma are going around with their mouth open. They're sleeping with their mouth open. They very often have nasal obstruction because if there's inflammation of the lungs, it travels up to the nose. When the nose is stuffy, they're more likely to mouth breathe. Mouth breathing is faster breathing and upper chest breathing. And this in turn then is more likely to put you into that increased sympathetic drive or increased stress response. So that in turn then can contribute to your asthma. And then because their mouth is open, their sleep is poor. So very often people with asthma are tired, children and adults. So, and this is a knock-on effect. And this is going to contribute then to anxiety because if your breathing is mouth and faster, it's more likely to cause increased, you know, agitation of the mind because we have some degree of control over our mind by changing our breathing patterns. And this, there's nothing woo woo about this, you know, like what are the benefits of breathing through your nose for asthma? You harness a gas called nitric oxide. Yeah. Nitric oxide is a bronchodilator. It's antiviral. Nitric oxide reduces chest infections. You breathe through your nose. It filters the incoming air. So airborne particles and um, the nose will have to remove them before you draw that air into the lungs. 
when you breathe through the nose, you've got a better gas exchange taking place. So there's a 10% increase in the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood from nasal breathing. The BBC documentary did, the BBC did a documentary on this back in 1994 or 1998. There was a journalist there called Sally Magnuson. Magnus Magnuson's daughter is a journalist. And she started noticing that people with asthma were making good progress if they applied the Buteco method. So she got interested and she started writing articles and she, she started following these people. Now, this is back, this is near almost 30 years ago. And the BBC commissioned a documentary and followed, they got three severe asthmatics out of a hospital and they had five days to make them better, five days. And they wow. made them better within five days. And these people are at wow. the end of the road of their treatment. They interviewed a doctor, Dr. Colin Spence in the United Kingdom. He's up in Glasgow. He talked about the cost of asthma medication before applying the breathing method. It cost 15,000 per annum. And after applying the breathing method, the Buteco method, it was 5,000 pounds per annum. So that's two thirds reduction in the expenditure of asthma medication. Now, this is not taken into consideration the improvement of quality of life because those three people, some of them, they weren't able to walk. And one woman, Donna, who you see in the, in the documentary, she was in hospital every, I, in, one, in that year, I think they did the test in November. She had six hospitalizations that year up to November. Wow. Now, so, you know, Philly, like I had a total sense of frustration when I, I learned this technique from my own asthma. I went and I made contact with people who were authorities. I explained it's so important for people with asthma to improve their breathing patterns, to breathe through their nose. They didn't want to know about it. They didn't want well, to know. There's no money in healthy people. <laughs> well, it's 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 really it's a terrible <laughs> indictment on society that everything seems to be driven about profit. Um, and that's part of the reason. So I said back then, well, if the pro healthcare professionals don't really want to know about this, this is back in 2002, how am I going to get this information out there? So I started writing books and that's how it happened. And journalists were really helpful. You know, in Ireland, we they did several, two or three um, uh, TV programs about it. Um, I worked with somebody with cystic fibrosis. They followed her. The people with asthma, they followed her. Um, journalists wrote full page articles in the, the broadsheets um, about the work that I was doing. And that's what that's how it happened. It happened wow. as a result of word of mouth. Now, is it that there's no evidence? There's 20 scientific trials looking at the application of... These are published these, trials. Yes, published. And, you know, okay, it's not so many, but we have to consider it's a breathing technique. It's very cost effective. There's no side effects. It's, it's kind know, of free. <laughs> it's free. Um, so on my TikTok, I have um, quite a lot of people uh, tragically suffering with anxiety. Now, when mm. I had my first panic attack, uh, I was about 17 and I went to the doctors uh, and it's terrifying when you have a panic attack. Mm. I mean, absolutely terrifying. I went to the doctors and they told me to breathe in a paper bag. Yes. Can you yep. explain that and, um, and what your thoughts are on that? With anxiety and panic disorder, 75% of the population have dysfunctional breathing. So anybody listening to this, there's a three quarters chance, or at least if 10 of you are listening to this, seven of you are likely to have poor breathing patterns. And what I mean by poor breathing, I'm talking about periodic mouth breathing or habitual mouth breathing, upper chest breathing, a little bit faster and or irregular breathing patterns. So frequent sighing. And oftentimes you might feel that you're just getting, you're not getting enough air. You just feel that, you know, no matter how you breathe, you just feel there's an air hunger there. That's going to feed into your symptoms because a person with that breathing pattern, then when they come across a uh, difficult situation, their body is reacting with harder and faster breathing. And harder and faster breathing, whether it's through the nose or mouth, is going to get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. The loss of carbon dioxide, because carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas, blood vessels constrict. So you can think that when you're breathing harder and faster, yes, you're taking more air into your lungs, but you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. And that causes your blood vessels to constrict. So blood flow to the brain 
reduces. In addition to that, red blood cells, which are carrying oxygen, don't release oxygen so readily. So now there's reduced oxygen delivery to the brain. And now the brain, brain is, of course, getting excited. And this is driving air hunger. It's driving breathing. So the whole purpose of the brown paper bag was you breathe in and out of the brown paper bag. You exhale into the bag. So you're exhaling carbon dioxide from your lungs into the bag, but then you rebreathe that carbon dioxide back into your lungs. You increase carbon dioxide in your lungs, which in turn increases carbon dioxide in the blood, which in turn helps to dilate the blood vessels and increases blood flow to the brain. Don't breathe in and out of brown paper bag though. The reason being is because if you breathe too many breaths, you're not getting oxygen in. Instead, if you're feeling the symptoms of panic, well, first of all, I would say is improve your everyday breathing patterns first. Yep, absolutely. So when there's a difficult situation, you're not going into that fight or flight response. Always think about this. Whenever there is a difficult situation, if we respond with faster breathing and upper chest breathing, which is a very natural reaction to a difficult situation, your brain is telling, your body is telling the brain that things are not okay. And your brain is here to protect you. So I if mean, the- you- so you you notice when um, whenever anything happens to put you into fight, flight, or freeze, yes, your breath work will automatically change. Yes, um, that's you know there could be the, the the tiger in the background, it could be the car coming towards you, whatever it is. The one thing that will happen is your breath will change and increase. Yes, and so yes. that is what we need to deal with on or learn to control on a day-to-day basis, basically, isn't it? We control it if we have an understanding over it. So always think of the speed of the exhalation. If you breathe out fast, your body is telling the brain that things are not okay. But if you take a soft breath in through your nose and you have a really slow and relaxed and gentle exhalation, your body is telling the brain that everything is okay. And your brain will send signals of calm back to the body. Yeah, and that actually takes you out of the sympathetic down into the parasympathetic nervous system where you can start healing. Um, A really good one that I do on a regular basis is a two times. So breathing in for two, out for four, or in for three, out for six. I mean, that's a very common one. Do you have any other? Yeah, we use we use different. If somebody if somebody's got very labored breathing, uh, they can find it difficult enough to breathe even in for two and out for three, or even though it's five five seconds, you're, you're reducing the respiratory rate down to 12 breaths per minute. Um, one that we use is to, if you're feeling symptoms, take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold your nose for between three and five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, let go. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe normally now for about 10 to 15 seconds. When people get anxious or panic, sometimes people get anxious or panic when they focus on their breathing. So if you get anxious when you focus on your breathing, Instead, just do breath holds because you don't have to focus on your breath. But what's happening here is if you take a normal breath in and out through your nose, and then you pinch your nose to stop breathing, it's prolonging the exhalation, which is helping to stimulate the vagus nerve, which is helping to bring a calmness to the body. So people with a lot of anxiety and stress, I would have them do this for between five and 10 minutes every hour, frequently, to increase carbon dioxide in the blood, to increase blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain, but also to give them the slight feeling of air hunger to desensitize their body's reaction to the strong suffocation alarm. So it's a very important thing there that like, and this is where we give a teaspoon of the panic disorder, a teaspoon of the panic attack, so that when you do feel suffocated, you're not going to launch into that fight or flight response. So we do want to improve everyday breathing. Now, coming back to the brown paper bag, An easier way to do that would be simply cup your hands on your face (laughs) and think about breathing slow. Because if you're breathing fast and shallow, you waste so much air to dead space. But if you breathe no slow and low, you will enhance the volume of air that's getting down into the small air sacs so that gas exchange can take place. So cupping your hands and breathing in, two, three, out, two, three, in, two, three, out two three or cupping your hands and breathing in two out two three four in two out two three four so to think of nose to think of slow and to think of low 
that as you breathe in, you're feeling the lower ribs gently move out. And as you breathe out, you're feeling the lower ribs gently moving in. Um, I, I've heard you talk about yoga breathing before, and I know you're not a, a yogi, <laughs> but yes. um, uh, there was there's a book that I've heard you recommend uh, from a yoga teacher um, who then became quite ill, uh, needed, she, I think, believe she came to work with you to do breath work, which is... Um, Quite bizarre. You don't think of yoga teachers needing to go yes. and have breath work. Uh, and then she went back to uh, some very, you know, because we none of this is reinventing the wheel. No. All of this has been written about for thousands and thousands of years. In yes, Sanskrit however, before. however, it's been totally misinterpreted. Yoga teachers are teaching breathing, but they could do so much more, you know, I really feel that there's some massive potential here for yoga to look at breathing exercises. They haven't done it, Philly. I'm sorry. They haven't yeah. tapped into the potential of the breath. You know, yoga and breathing is not just about the biomechanics. We have to think about the autonomic nervous system, but we also have to think about the biochemistry. We have to think about breathing outside the mat. How is the person breathing during exercise? How are they breathing during sleep? How is their breath hold time? How is their functional breathing? You know, can you think of the number of people going to yoga studios with anxiety? They have mm -hmm. faster upper chest breathing. They're breathing through an open mouth. That's not being addressed. You know, okay, there's some attention on the biomechanics, but there's very little attention on the biochemistry. And it, I feel that just the potential for yoga, it could be absolutely transformative. But we need yoga people to, to realize that breathing is, it is more complex. It's multidimensional but it's simple at the same time. And that's why I wrote the book, The Breathing Cure, because breathing is seen too woo-woo. It's seen over here and left. There's nothing woo-woo about breathing. Nothing. No, nothing. nothing. You know, but it's sometimes the fields or people who are teaching breathing exercises can put normal individuals off. I've never wanted to do that because I don't consider I'm not left of field and nor am I'm, I'm totally scientific over here, right of field. I'm just right down... I think anyway, somewhere in the middle, I wrote the breathing cure because I wanted to show that there was a huge body of science behind it. And it's a 190,000 word book. And when you like for different conditions for epilepsy, like why aren't people with epilepsy shown how to auto bring balance to their autonomic nervous system and improve their sleep? Diabetes, the same. Asthma, the same. Um, craniofacial. It, it does so many different functions there. Like it's the one thing about breathing is that it's under our voluntary control. And by influencing our breathing, we influence the automatic functioning of the body. And if you have an individual who is in that increased stress response and reduced relaxation response, that individual is not going to heal quickly because they're not in the right condition. The body is not going to heal when the body is in a total state of chronic stress. And chronic stress is contributing to inflammation. So, and again, how many conditions then are impacted by inflammation? So well, there was, of, yeah, so, sorry. The, the work of Kevin Tracy, who's a neuroscientist, back in 1998, he was experimenting with rats. He stimulated the vagus nerve and he found that he could reduce inflammation. And then he did experiments with people with rheumatoid arthritis by stimulating the vagus nerve. And that we can all stimulate the vagus nerve through our breathing. If we breathe light, like one of the revelations to me when I got, came across breathing is I try different breathing techniques before that, taking these full big breaths, because that's what people say, this full big breath. Like, what are, you, what are you doing when you're taking a full big breath? But getting rid of carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. What's that doing? Your blood vessels constrict. There's a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Less oxygen gets delivered. It's kind of ironic that when you take this full big breath, it's a stressor and it reduces oxygen delivery. That needs to get out there because how many people are told when they're feeling stressed or feeling down, pull yourself together and take a few big breaths for yourself. The worst advice possible because all it will do is reduce blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. Yes, you take a big breath, it feels better, but long term it's not because it keeps you stuck in that place. So how do we stimulate this vagus nerve? Underbreed, and this is where the person with panic disorder has to be careful. You're sitting down, take a very soft breath in through the nose and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle exhalation. 
and a very, very soft breath in, almost that you're hardly feeling the airflow coming into your body and a really relaxed and slow, gentle exhalation. To breathe a little bit less than what you were breathing before you started and to feel a tolerable air hunger. So if you get stressed, take a rest and come back to it. The tolerable air hunger is because carbon dioxide is increased in the blood. So that's giving you the feeling of air hunger. But pay attention to the saliva in the mouth. When you can stimulate the vagus nerve and activate the body's rest and digest response, you will know it by the increased watery saliva in the mouth because the body now is prepared for the digestion of food. Three minutes of breathing light. Doing the actual thing that is the opposite to what most people talk about can help to stimulate the vagus nerve. And you know what that de then does, does is that it's helping your breathing from a biochemical dimension that your breathing automatically now becomes slower. So the brain is spying on our breathing. It's not just that there's communication from the body up, but the brain is also is spying on our breathing. And if the brain senses, there's a structure, the locus corollis, which Stanford Medical School found is, is spying on your breathing. And if you're breathing fast, the part of the brain then will relay signals of agitation to the rest of the brain. But if you're breathing slow, this part of the brain, which is spying on your breathing, will relay signals of calm to the rest of the brain. So that's irrespective of breathing using the diaphragm. That's irrespective of the vagus nerve. It's tapping into something else differently, but everything is coming together. It comes back to this. Don't breathe fast and hard during rest. It's a stressor. If you want to yeah. bring your body and mind into relaxation, think about nose, think about light, think about slow, and think about low. I know myself. I don't teach slow breathing to children because what's the point of it? You know, but I will teach them small breath holds. I will teach them to go for a light run with their mouth closed. I will teach them to do a breath hold holding their breath to increase blood flow. So there's other ways of teaching exercise to kids to get kids to bring this into their everyday life. And but, let's, but also let's focus athletes. On what, yes, yes. Um, there's tremendous research on athletes and, and how they can perform better when they're breathing properly with their mouth closed. Um, there's there's yes. a lot of research on this. We'd love to see more. Um, there's more research coming out, you know, nasal breathing during sports. The benefits are, there's a, many benefits in terms of cognition, in terms of even by doing your training with your mouth closed, you're adding an extra load onto the breathing muscles. You're helping to strengthen them. You're helping to reduce ventilation then during physical exercise. So it's not about necessarily having the mouth closed during 100% of your physical activity, but it's during light to moderate exercise to have your mouth closed. There is a time, say, if a person is sprinting, that they open their mouth. So we don't want them sprinting with the mouth closed because then it could be very uncomfortable and you might hurt the inside of the nose. But in the main, I think recreational athletes should do their best to adapt nasal breathing during their physical exercise because nasal breathing far outweighs mouth breathing during exercise. There's reduced oxygen uptake with mouth breathing. There's more upper chest breathing with mouth breathing. There's trauma to the upper airways with mouth breathing. Exercise induced asthma is more prevalent. With nasal breathing, there's so many benefits in terms of using this as a breathing technique to change your breathing states because mouth breathing does not improve your breathing during okay. physical exercise, but nose breathing well. I mean, if you if you're studying medicine or you're studying the body, you know, the nose, they give you yes. all these different functions for the nose and the mouth is just kind of eating. Zero. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I have to ask you this because um, recently my daughter went to the dentist yes. and they took out a wisdom tooth. And they want her to go back and have the other three taken out. And the wisdom tooth went septic. Um, and um, we don't really know many people anymore that haven't had a root canal, a to you know, a tooth taken out, a root canal, a wisdom tooth taken out. Um, and I try to explain to my daughter, so Tali, this is for you, uh, that you can change. They, they said they absolutely had to come out because they were crooked. Um, the teeth are crooked. So um, I'd like you to ex explain to my daughter yeah. and everybody else listening how you can change the shape of your mouth with the breath work and the tongue. There's two, schools of, thought, <laughs> there's two schools of thought in dentistry. You have your traditional orthodontist who will say that 
the reason that the teeth are crooked is because the teeth are too big. So in order to straighten teeth, then you have to extract teeth. The other school of thought is saying that the reason that teeth are took, sorry, the reason that teeth are crooked is because the jaws are too small. They'll say, let's gently develop the jaws to make room for the teeth. Now, which preference would I go for? I would absolutely go for this one here, functional orthodontics, because we have 32 teeth and overcrowding of teeth is not necessarily because the teeth are too big. It's very often due to the jaw. The jaws are too small. Now, the problem with the jaws when they're too small is that there's not enough room for the tongue in the, in the roof of the mouth. And as a result, then the tongue is more likely to encroach the airway. So the functional orthodontist who will put in appliances and also educate in terms of nose breathing with correct tongue resting posture, because your tongue is scaffolding for the jaws. But if you were a child growing up with your mouth closed and three quarters of your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, it's the pressures exerted by the tongue which help to direct the growth of the face forward, because your tongue is pushing everything forward to help open up the airways. I have a small mouth, so there's not much room for my tongue. My tongue is going into my throat, and this would be part of the reason anatomically why I had sleep issues all of those times because of chronic mouth breathing. So I think when a dentist or an orthodontist says that we have to get three or four teeth extracted, you have to then ask, well, what are, are the repercussions then on the size of the jaws? Removing teeth, straightening the teeth, and the jaws now get even smaller again. Now, they might have been already small anyway, and that's caused the overcrowding. But now if you remove the teeth, you make the jaws even smaller. But now where's the tongue going to go? The tongue is either in the roof of the mouth or it's falling into the throat. But for it to be in the roof of the mouth, we want to have that really nice shaped maxilla, which is your top jaw and forward growth, and also a mandible with forward growth that the airway is better. I would say get a second opinion. Um, I would say don't do the extractions for the moment, but find a dentist that's near you and just ask, can you do a consultation and get a second opinion? Can these teeth be saved? We only have 32 teeth. We have to hold on to them. It's really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also very important to know that, you know, my daughter was gobsmacked when I said to her, you can change the shape of your jaw and your mouth yes. through breath work. And she went, don't be yes. so stupid. And yet yes. she's going, it's, it's stuck there, it's bone. But you can you can change the shape no, of it's, any it's, part of your body. Yes, and there's more, like originally back 10, 15 years ago, we were also saying that you couldn't. Um, now it, there, seems to be, there seems to be evidence out there, especially direct observations of dentists and people in the field, that we can actually influence the growth of the face, even in adulthood. Um, there are different appliances, of course, that help. Um, for example, like one of the, the best individuals in the United Kingdom, I think if you're based in, in the UK, Philly, is Dr. John Mew. And he's 90 years of age and he's a fascinating individual. I reached out to them in 2009, 2008. And they said, Patrick, you're very welcome to come over to the clinic. I used to fly over and I used to sit in their clinic, two orthodontists, father and son, John and Mike Mew. And I used to watch them working with patients and I was writing the book on this and I returned many, many, many times. And that's why I wrote a little book called Buteco Meets Dr. Mew. And this was about his work. He's known this for 50 years, but there's a very interesting story because the British Dental Council didn't want to hear of his work. And they eventually took away his license as a 90 year old orthodontist. Wow. They took away his license because he didn't wear gloves when he was working with one of his patients. He had his hands cleaned, but he was working without the gloves. And because he hadn't the gloves on, even though the hands were cleaned, they got him on that. Oh, um, so oh, is I understand that, like, you know, he, they can be a little bit passionate in what they can. I can understand that because there can be frustration that they've seen. Like there's the dispatches did a documentary on this channel Four dispatches which if you go into YouTube, so earlier on, I spoke about the BBC documentary. So if you go in, into YouTube and put in BBC, QED, Buteco, B-U-T-E-Y-K-O. We'll put all of this in the show we'll notes so that, yeah. But it's really worth looking at the dispatches documentary on this that was also done. And they got groups of identical twins 
with um, overcrowding of teeth. Now, it's kind of a weird study. One of the twins went through traditional treatment and the other twin did John Mew's work. And then they looked at the, how the shapes, the faces had developed. The twins that did John Mew's work without extraction, with forward development of the jaws, were better looking individuals than the individuals who would extraction. Because what happens when your teeth are extracted? Where are your jaws going to go? But back 75% of the population with anxiety and panic disorder are having dysfunctional breathing patterns, which is feeding into their anxiety and panic disorder. I'm currently reading articles, paper, published papers on depression and obstructive sleep apnea. And I wrote about it because I remember somebody coming into me with depression. And you know, when you just feel there's something not right here and I'm working with her and I'm saying, I said, has anybody ever asked you about your sleep quality? And she said, no. And she was waking up exhausted every morning. And I was just thinking to myself, the healthcare professional in this instance is thinking that her depression is causing her to be exhausted. But we should be probably asking the question is that here's a person that could have insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea. And this is what's driving her exhaustion and depression. Yep, so absolutely. How, then do we, how then do we help depression if we don't address her sleep issues? How do we help depression if we don't help to balance the autonomic nervous system? You know, and the same with anxiety panic disorder. So I think there's a really, there's a huge disconnect out there. Um, but the good news is breathing is now getting a chance. You know, there's been a tremendous, I would say almost a revolution with it that people are yeah. realizing it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Now, I <laughs> I hate to bring this up because I know that you, you have very, very different trains of thought, but, you know, Wim Hof storming it at the moment. Um, sure. Um, I, I also, I love Soma Breathwork. Um, I'm sure. training as a Soma Breathwork coach. And I know that these push you beyond your limits. You know, they are taking you so far outside your comfort zone. It's unreal. Do you think there's a place for them? I, I mean, the reason I wanted to absolutely interview you, one, I'm passionate about your work, and two, I think it is just such a lovely, gentle way just to get people to understand about breath and, and how important it is for all these different ailments. And, you know, um, but do you think there is a, a place for that pushing out your comfort zone? The Wim Hof Met is very much a stressor technique hyperventilation yeah driving up your blood ph blood flow is reduced oxygen delivery is reduced you've got a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve then you do a long breath hold your blood oxygen saturation is dropping 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 so it drops down to about 85 percent which is severe hypoxia then you breathe in you hold your breath for 10 seconds you hyperventilate again the second and third breath hold the third breath hold your blood oxygen saturation dropping to below 50 percent or even it could be 60%, 50%. I've had cases of 30%. Um, I don't work specifically. I don't do the Wim Hof method, but we do similar stressor exercises, but it's controlled. My only concern that I think it needs further investigation is what happens blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain when you drop your blood oxygen saturation below 50%. There is a reduction of blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. Is it good to expose the brain to hypoxia. And I don't think we have the answers. We are trying to find some information on this. This is different than doing free diving. Free diving, you breathe in, you hold your breath, or you breathe in, breathe out, and hold your breath, but you don't have the hyperventilation. It's the hyperventilation before a breath hold that's problematic because the hyperventilation is getting rid of so much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. This allows you to hold your breath for so much longer. Yeah. But in the process of holding your breath for so much longer, now your blood oxygen saturation is going so low. Should we be doing a technique that we don't fully understand the consequences of it? Now, I get into trouble when I talk about this, unfortunately. But all I'm trying to do is approach it from the point of view of breathing. And I said earlier on, I said, I've made plenty of mistakes with breathing. I've had people with chronic fatigue syndrome. I floor them. I've put people into panic disorder. I put one guy into accident and emergency. I've made plenty of mistakes. I don't want to make mistakes. 
If it makes you feel any better, yes. the third biggest killer of mankind is actually Western medicine, according to the John Hopkins <laughs> Institute. So the sure. fact that you've had a couple of people that have reacted, sure. um, don't worry about it. There are lots of doctors yeah. out there killing people. But, <laughs> but yeah, of course. But, you know, at the same time, I know you don't I, want I to. Love to. I love to learn from it. And this is where you tweak everything, because ultimately, when I see a breathing technique, I want to understand, well, what exactly is this technique doing? Now, we do superventilation or hyperventilation, but we do it for 20 breaths, but we do it nose. We do a breath hold afterwards, but then we do the breathe light to restore. I think it's important if you hyperventilate, which is a stressor, then do relaxation. One has to be balanced off the other. Stimulate the, 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 the sympathetic, increase the sympathetic drive, the stress response, but always think about recovery. It's really important. And also, don't think that when you're hyperventilating that more oxygen is getting delivered throughout your body. That may yeah. not be the case. That's the thing as well. Yeah. No, I, it's it's amazing. I mean, I do breath work every day and I have done um, for... I, I'm actually a newbie. I only discovered... Sure breath work four years ago with the heart math institute so sure, sure. I, I mean i i love the heart math institute with yes um all the research that's come out of there um and then in the first lockdown i discovered soma uh, and it was the first time i was ever able to meditate because i tried mindfulness and i just couldn't do it it was just like nah yeah. <laughs> what should i have for dinner <laughs> what should i do here and i i just could not do mindfulness and just by bringing that awareness to my breath, I was able to learn to meditate mm. big time. Mm. I mean, really, really big time. And I'm a shit hot manifester now. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. And I think it's that's nice as well to hear. You, things go your way when you're in that state of mind. You're more receptive if you're saying you're a shit hot man manifester. I got you here, love. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. <laughs> so listen, um, we are out of time. We've gone on. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. Patrick McEwen, that has just been a fascinating, fascinating interview. Um, every time I listen to you. Oh, oh, before we go, there is one story of yours that I've uh, I've heard you say a couple of times. Um, and I just want this audience to hear it because the importance of the slow breathing, uh, you explained brilliantly with opera singers and how in the olden days, a couple of hundred years ago, um, can you explain how they were taught to sing? Mm. There was very much an emphasis on conservation of the breath. And, and they had a candle there, didn't they? They had a candle flame that was about eight inches from their face. And they were to sing it full pelt, but without blowing out the candle flame. Wow. See, if, if we're breathing too hard and too fast, it drives up heart rate. And it can contribute to fatigue as well. You know, people who talk for a living. And you're talking to a group of your, your colleagues and you're talking, 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 talking. Or if you're a school teacher, whatever occupation you're in, if you're talking all day, but if you don't have constraint of the breath, you're going to be exhausted in the evening. So I assume that part of the reason with the opera singer was that it was about conservation of the breath to protect the airways, but also to influence the physiology. Because if they are breathing too hard and too fast, we've got limited energy. We're going to lose that. And yep. yeah, conservation is, is very, very important. Brilliant. Now, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been an sure. absolute joy. We'll put everything in the show notes, uh, everything you've mentioned. Uh, where can people find you, Patrick? Um, just tell the audience yeah. now in case they're not looking at the show notes where sure. they can come and find we, you. We just set up on TikTok recently. Um, <laughs> so we do have a TikTok channel. I think we've got about a thousand members the last three weeks or so. Um, Oxygen Advantage. So Oxygen Advantage is both websites and uh, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. And we also have Buteyko Clinic, B-U-T-E-Y-K-O Clinic. And there's many books there. And as I said, you know, the videos are free up on YouTube as well for, for many instances there. So I would say to people, yeah, don't, um, don't discount the breath. It can really, really be helpful to you. But when you're practicing exercises, listen to your body and listen to that feedback and start off easy. 
and just gently apply yourself to it. Because if you if you start off gently, you can gear up as opposed to going, going in too hard and too fast and it sets you back. So that's an important thing to do, you know. So, yeah. Well, um, your message, um, I think, gives so much hope to people that there is so much that they can do for their health. Uh, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Patrick McGuin, sure. thank you so, Pleasure. so much for joining me today on Breath. Thanks very much, Philly. Pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.